So this kind of integration technique is called trigonometric substitution. So back in Calculus 1, when you first learned about what definite integrals were, you said, oh, these things are areas under curves, right? And I want to find areas of certain things like rectangles, right, and triangles, and on the rare occasion, a circle of some sorts, right? So the thing you have to notice if you're going to do this integral is you have to recognize what the heck is root 1 minus x squared, and here's how you do that. Let it be y. So y is the root of 1 minus x squared. If you square both sides, what do you get? Y squared, 1 minus x squared. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, technically speaking, you've introduced some extra stuff there, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Or if I write it as x squared plus y squared equals 1, so can you tell me what that? It's a circle. Where is its center? The origin, its radius is 1. So that's a circle centered at the origin, radius 1. Now, the original equation was just the positive square root, which means that you just have the top half of said circle only, okay? As in that's what, if you wanted the bottom half, you'd have to have a negative in front of that root sign, okay? And what do these bounds tell you? You want the area from where to where? From over there to over there, right? As in you have the, it's a semicircle. So that integral is 1 half pi r squared, where r is equal to what? 1. one. So its area, or the value of that integral is pi over, pi over 2. And I suspect a lot of you felt like that way was kind of like cheating a little bit. Do you agree with me, Tad? Like it feels as if like, oh, well, you've never actually proven the area of a circle is pi r squared. Like, your elementary school teacher said, this is what it is, and you said, why? Because, you know, that's what you do when you're, like, seven years old. And they said, because I said so. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you really need to know calculus, two to prove it. So in this, once we learn how to do some more integration stuff, you can prove that an area of a circle is pi r squared. You can do it with an integral. And doing so involves something, the trig substitution. And so we're going to do that with a specific problem. Thank you. I think you're on that one. Okay, so we're going to substitute x equals sine theta and why it will become clear in a second. Now, when we do that, we also have to replace dx. So if x is sine theta, what is um, dx? Cosine theta. And we also need to change the bounds. So if x equals one, that's the same thing as saying one equals sine theta. So what angle makes that happen? Theta is pi over 2. I mean, lots of angles make that happen, but we're just going to go with sort of the most, the one between negative pi halves and pi halves. And if x equals negative 1, then negative 1 is sine theta, and that's for theta equals negative pi halves. We'll talk more about why we have to use those angles in just a sec. Oh, and just another aside, I graded quizzes from my distance class today, and you really need to change your bounds when you integrate, even if you didn't learn it that way. It's just so much better. And if you have a hard time with it, come talk to me, and I'll explain to you why it works. Like, okay, it, it really is better. Suck it up and learn it. Okay, yes? So you can't just, like, not change Suck it up and learn it. But go back. Shush, shush. Okay, come talk to me, and we'll discuss why my way is superior to your way, okay? <laughs> so... All right, and I think I can convince you in like five minutes that this is true, okay? Like, I think it really is faster. You'll like it more. Okay, so when we do this, this integral becomes the integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 root 1 minus sine squared theta times cosine theta d theta. Is everyone okay with what happened with the substitution there? Yeah, you got to give me a nod or give me a head shake. Yeah, okay, okay, sweet. So this is helpful because, because don't, first of all, square roots don't distribute. Never, ever, ever don't distribute square roots. Well, they do if you have a zero, but in general, never, ever, ever. So can you somehow simplify 1 minus a sine squared so it can be rooted? Uh, yeah, make it cosine squared. Then yeah. Cosine squared is just cosine. Does that make sense, guys? Make that into cosine squared. So it's root 
cosine squared theta times cosine theta d theta, and the root of the squared just makes the, the thing that was squared. And though, so that's so you have cosine theta times cosine theta, which makes cosine squared theta. And great. And do you know how to do this? As in, did we learn a way to do this? Half angle. Half angle, yep. And one more thing I want to show you, because Professor Fabri did her notes this way. She said twice integral 0 to pi halves cosine squared theta. Why can you do that? When can you do that? You can do it. Is that what you're asking for, Mary-Kate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can do that when you have an even function and a symmetric integral. Do you know what I mean by those two things? Okay. So when the absolute value of the two bounds is the same? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. it goes from negative a to a was the way it was phrased in Calc 1. Okay, so then we do the 2 times the half, 0 to pi halves, um, 1 plus cosine of 2 theta, yes? Anti-differentiate, and we have theta. What's the antiderivative of cosine 2 theta? 1 half sine 2 theta from 0 to pi halves. And you input stuff, and I think you just get pi halves. Officially gets pi halves plus a half sine pi minus 0 plus a half sine 0. But every single term except for that first one is 0, right? Sine of pi is 0, yes? So did we get the same answer both ways? Yes? Okay, for the record, if you recognize that you can use the area of a circle, you can do it use like part A. You don't have to do it this way. Like if you can recognize that this is what happens and you do it as part A, totally fine, great. But this type of situation will let us solve certain kinds of integrals. A big hint that you're gonna use this kind of technique is that you have a radical because you can use these trig identities to take a radical that can't be rooted and manipulate in, it into something that can be rooted. Does that make sense? So a big hint for that this technique will work is that there is a radical. It's not always true. There are some problems for which there is no radical and you still have to use this technique. There's an example of that on the recitation worksheet you're gonna do next Tuesday. It might also be a web assign problem. Maybe take a quiz problem too. Hint, hint. Okay. So here we go. So trig substitutions this is used to evaluate integrals that often involve radicals of this form. And based on the way the radical is given, you choose different substitutions. So this one is kind of like the previous one we had that was 1 minus x squared, right? So what you're going to use here is you're going to let u equal a sine of theta. You could let u equal a cosine theta, like that wouldn't be wrong, but what's the nice thing, if you, the nice thing of letting u equal a sine theta is that du is then a cosine theta d theta, as in it's positive, not negative. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and let's just talk about what that thing simplifies to if you plug this in, okay? So if you plug that in, root a squared minus u squared becomes root a squared minus a squared sine squared. Do you buy that? Because if I put in a sine theta for u, you do a sine theta times a sine theta, both the a and the sine get squared. You want to factor? factor out the greatest common factor of a squared. Okay, and then this becomes root a squared cosine squared theta, right? Is that okay? Okay, now you can say that this equals a cosine theta if a couple things are true. So first thing that must be true, 
what kind of number is going to come out of this business? Is it going to be a positive number or a negative number? Positive, positive number, right? So A has got to be positive, and your cosine theta has to be positive, and this is where the fact that theta has to be in between pi halves and negative pi halves comes in. I guess you could theoretically have them both be negative, but you almost never let a equal a negative number. So does that make sense? And this, this restriction is really, really quite rare that it actually matters to you. But technically saying this equals this does depend upon you having a theta in the right angle. Because if your theta was, I don't know, five pi quarters, all of a sudden cosine's negative, right? So anyway. Yep, and, or if you have no bounds at all, and then when you, you would use it to evaluate definite integrals that only had the appropriate bounds. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Most of the ones you're going to handle are going to be indefinite integrals. So in that case, it's just not going to come up all that often. And the ones that are definite are doctored to work out for you. Yes? Uh, if we... Go, go, one, did you finish, and then you can say, yes? Uh, if we do an indefinite integral with this method, do we make a note uh, only valid for... Well, I think in general we haven't been requiring students to do that, and if I do, if we do decide to do so, I'll let you know. Okay, like so, no, not right now. Okay. Okay. Yes, Desmond. Okay, so since it's multiplication and not a addition. Radicals distribute. Radical? Yep. Yes, you can. So, the technical, the thing you would have heard is that radicals um, distribute over multiplication, as in when the operation in between your two things is multiplication, but not over addition. Does that make sense? Somebody else had a clear hand up, and I don't know what that was about. Yeah. A is a constant. A is a constant, yep. OK. So what, identity, what other identities do you have? You have um, tangent squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta, right? So that's kind of like variable squared plus number, right? You see how we kind of have variable squared plus number? So you just think quite similar. You let u equal a tangent of theta. So in that case, root a squared plus u squared is root a squared plus a squared tan squared. Oh, and one more thing. If my u was a tan theta, what would the du be? A secant squared theta, d theta. OK. So then this thing simplifies. You factor out the a squared. a squared, 1 plus tan squared. 1 plus tan squared simplifies to secant squared. So you can say that's a secant theta, assuming, again, a is positive. And secant theta is actually 1 over cosine. Does that make sense? So, and so you look at, so secant will be positive in the same places that cosine is positive. Does that make sense? So the only thing here is you have to have theta between pi halves and negative pi halves again. But in general, that restriction is just not going to come up that much. So don't worry too much about it. Do you evaluate secant pi halves? No, you can't. But we'll be able to deal. But well, but in this class, we'll learn how to deal with integrals where you're you have infinite discontinuities at endpoints or in the middle. So that that's section seven eight. Okay. So the greater or equal to is positive. Yeah. Okay. And then how is is c different than is this third one different than the first one? Yeah. yeah. And so here you use a secant theta. And why will become clear when you try to simplify the radical. So if that's your u, your du is what? A secant theta, tan theta, d theta. Yep. Good job. So root u squared minus a squared. That becomes root. Oh. A squared secant squared theta minus a squared. 
once again, you factor out the a squared. What does secant squared theta simplify down to? Tangent theta. So a squared tan squared theta. So that's a tan theta. <coughs> a is bigger than zero. And then tangent looks roughly speaking like this, right? Ish. So when is tangent positive for what angles? Uh, zero. zero to pi over pi halves. And then you could also go from this is pi to three pi halves. So this pi. is pi over two. This would be pi there, right? or theta from, this would be three pi halves. You could also get that from the unit circle, right? Tangent is positive in this quadrant, right? And also in this quadrant, yes? Mm -hmm. So for theta between pi and three pi halves. So we'll just do an example of trying each substitution, and then you'll take your quiz. Yes? Wouldn't it just be less than greater than or Well, we, yeah, that's true. So we, at, at those endpoints, it is actually zero, but the equality still holds when it's, wait, what you're saying is that tangent is undefined. No, tangent's not undefined at zero. At, you mean at pi halves. In that case, it's kind of like a times infinity, so I think it's still okay. I have to check the technicality, and like I said, it's not the most important thing, so I just wouldn't worry about it at this stage, okay? Yeah. Yes? So you said we need calculus for the area of the circle? Yes. So how did we uh, know the formula for an area of the formula for calculus? Someone you told you? As I said, I think that the, oh, oh, that's a good discussion for a later date, okay? We'll discuss that in chapter six, I promise, okay? But we'll discuss why the Arab circle is pi r squared. We'll also discuss the exhaustive method the Greeks used to prove it. Okay? All right. So with this one, what's your substitution going to be? Is it going to be the one involving sine, tangent, or secant? Sine. Great. And how do you compensate for this 25? Make it a, yeah, make x equal 5 sine theta. Because then when you square x, you're going to get a GCF of 25 inside the radical. Does that make sense? Yes? Couldn't you recognize that it's uh, in the formula of like arc sine? Oh, it would be arc sine if that other x squared wasn't in the denominator. Oh. Does that make sense? So that's the problem. OK, now you need to replace everything. And if you're going to make a mistake on this stuff, the mistake you're going to make is you're going to forget to replace dx. And if you forget to replace dx, the integral almost always becomes impossible to actually evaluate. So if you get a problem and you're like, holy crap, I can't do this, you probably forgot to put in dx. I say probably because it could just be a hard problem, okay? But that is a very likely candidate. So what's dx going to be in this case? Five cosine theta d theta. Okay, now replace everything. So is there a reason you put the dx in the numerator instead of just putting the one over everything dx? Nope, no reason. And if I ever put two dx's in something, it's a typo, mm -hmm. okay? Always. So I got five cosine theta in my numerator because that replaces my dx. In the denominator, I'm going to have 25 sine squared theta root 25 minus 25 sine squared theta. Is that okay? So what's this stuff? It's good to be a little bit fast with this. What's this radical going to simplify to? Uh huh. And then it's going to become 25 cosine squared theta, right? So when you radical it, because every noun can be a verb, right? So sorry for your English teachers. 
that becomes five cosine theta, right? Do you agree? Okay. I also reduce the five over twenty-five at the same time. Is that okay? And yes, you can cancel out the cosines, of course. So this becomes, I'm going to take out the, you'll have 1 25th, take out the coefficient, integral 1 over sine squared theta d theta, right? Does everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. So what is 1 over sine squared? Which, inver which reciprocal <coughs> trig function? Cosecant squared, so 1, t one t 25th. Antiderivative cosecant squared theta d theta. Great job. Negative cotangent theta plus c. Okay. Now. Yes. It was on the recitation number one review worksheet. That you, I believe you did. As in, like, everybody, everybody was supposed to do it, but the integral of cosecant squared is definitely cotangent. Um, now, the question is, how the heck do you change those things? Is everyone okay with that, that stuff? What happened there? This is a rule you're just supposed to know. Cotangent's derivative is cosecant squared. So anti-differentiate cosec is negative cosecant squared. Anti-differentiate cosecant squared, you get negative cotangent. Kind of like the Ringo, the trig identities. Yeah. Nobody remembers it. Now you have to chain, and it's going to come up a lot in this section because there's very few problems that like work up really nicely. So it's just going to happen a fair amount. Change thetas to x's. If you had a definite integral, you don't take your thetas back to x's as long as you change the bounds. But if it's indefinite, you've got to change the thetas back to x's. And you end up using basic trigonometry. So you had x equals 5 sine theta, yes? So would you agree if I said that sine of theta is equal to x over 5? Okay, so go back to your geotrig happy place. Make a right triangle. Yeah. Sine, you can use your little Sokotoa thing. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So this side is x, this side is 5. And then you use your super favorite theorem, which is the Pythagorean theorem, to find the other side. So you've got 5 squared equals x squared plus, say, b squared, for example. So what's that side going to be? root 25 minus x squared, exactly. Now, if tangent is opposite over adjacent, what is cotangent? The reciprocal, adjacent over opposite, right? So you take that triangle and you take your adjacent side, which is the root thing. Oopsies, sorry. So negative root thing over... That 25 is getting up in the bottom. What's the opposite side? X. X. And that's your antiderivative. Yes? And you said that you would only convert it back to X if it's a definite integral? If I, I meant to say indefinite integral. If it were a definite integral, which we'll have examples of next time, you don't have to change them back to x's, and it's actually a little bit easier. Because there's no need to go, no need to make the triangle at all. So for indefinite. For indefinite, you have to do this. Yep. And it's also not okay to just say theta is, I don't know, arc sine x over 5. Can you see how I would have gotten that? Yeah. And then plug that in. It just, I won't consider that done, because technically cotangent of arc sine simplifies, and you simplify it using that triangle. So I'll give you most of the credit, but definitely not all of the credit if you do that. Okay? All right. Where did the 25x come from? Cotangent 
is equal to adjacent over opposite. So the cotangent of this theta is root 25 minus x squared over x. And then that times the negative 1 25th. When you multiply fractions, it's numerator times numerator, denominator times denominator. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So how about this guy? What does it look like it's going to be? Which substitution? The tangent one. And notice how this is the one is what determines the a. So in this case, the a is one. This 9x squared is the same thing as 3x, the quantity squared. Do you buy that? <laughs> Integral dx over root 3x quantity squared plus one. So what you do in that instance is you just let 3x equal tan theta. Those would be just single x. Constants don't really do that much, do they? I don't like a face, but so differentiate this side and you get 3 dx, right? Equals what? A secant squared theta d theta. And then if you're replacing dx, just take that and solve for dx. dx will equal a third secant squared theta d theta. one-third integral secant squared theta d theta all over root tan squared theta plus one. Do you guys buy that? What does tan squared theta plus one simplify to? Secant squared, which then roots to secant. So secant squared over secant will make secant. This becomes one-third integral of secant. And we're not making you memorize these formulas. If it's on a quiz, we'll give them to you. So this is one-third natural log absolute value secant theta plus tan theta. You're probably going to end up memorizing them because it's going to come up so often like in this section even though you don't want to. At least for this semester, you like, oh, yeah, I know the antiderivative of that. I think we're out of time. Crap, we are? Okay. Well, we'll finish this next time, so we'll pop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will pass as quickly as I can. You can use pencils in your brains. No calculators? Calculators are too good at grading for you. Here we go. And I didn't upload this yet because we weren't done. So we were at the stage where we had to make the, um, the thetas back into x's. Does that make sense? And what did we use to do that? Do you remember? Use a triangle. Yeah, so our substitution was tangent of theta equals 3x. I'm going to write that as 3x over 1. In your triangle, tangent is opposite. Mm -hmm. And then what's the other side according to the Pythagorean theorem? With the x's and stuff. 
Root 9x squared plus 1. Uh-huh. Root 9x squared plus 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's good you will do that quickly. It's, you know, 1 squared plus 3x squared is 1 plus 9x squared, right? Then you root it to get the side. Okay, great. So now, secant. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So if cosine, so ca adjacent over hypotenuse, secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, so that would be... Mm -hmm. And then tangent is just 3x, I believe, right? You can get that from the triangle or from the fact that 3x was equal to tangent theta was your substitution back in the beginning, right? Okay. There you go. The next one? Yeah? Okay. All right. So this one. So we've had a substitution that's involved sine, tangent, and next we have to use, the other one we have is, uh, I think it's cosecant technically will work, but we're using secant because secant's derivative is positive. So, excuse me. No problem. So if x is equal to, how do you account for that 36? You need a 6. And then you're going to have to say x equals 6 secant theta. And like I said yesterday, the thing that you are liable to forget is to replace dx. And if you don't replace dx, you're going to make the problem like impossible to solve. So just if you come across a problem like you did and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so stuck, it probably is you forgot dx. If that isn't the case, then email me. Okay, dx is equal to 6 secant theta tan theta d theta. Okay, plug that stuff in, simplify, tell me what you get. Okay, just go ahead and do. Don't look at the board until you've, you've done. I'll do it, but I'll write lots of steps. You can write fewer steps than me. You're still on the previous section. We're still on the previous section, yep. Exactly. Put the 6 in so that that becomes the GCF, and if you hadn't put 6 in, you couldn't take that GCF out. Exactly. And it's, it's not so it cancels this 6. Like, that won't always happen. That's not the reason. The reason is, is so that this step can be done, and it can be changed into a Pythagorean identity that you know. Do you guys understand that question? Okay. 6 secant theta tan theta over, what does secant squared theta minus 1 become? Tan squared. And I think at that stage you can tell me you get, I think you just get secant theta. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, right? Okay. If you can do this in fewer steps, I don't care. Like, it's okay. I just have not clear much to write for you guys to see it. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the antiderivative of secant? Mm -hmm. ln secant theta plus tan theta. You don't have to have that one memorized, but it's probably going to happen against your will. You know, that would be a good uh, uh, quote for the, uh, the, well, for the pamphlets, college. You'll learn stuff against your will. <laughs> Oh, one more thing. When I was grading the quizzes, um, it's really, really helpful if you try to keep your stuff organized. So try to use equal signs between steps the same way that I do. Like, if you didn't do it, I didn't take off points, but I put a bunch of equal signs in your quizzes. Eventually, we will dock points for that. So, like, 
okay? So just in the ventilator, and I'll give you a warning before we do, okay? Like I'll remind you. And then also try to keep your substitutions kind of and your work kind of like off to one side and then like the actual steps on the other. Does that make sense? And I do get that quizzes are timed and constrained. So if you really need to use scratch paper because you write humongous, I don't care. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. What was your question? Um, so like I'll like skip. So if there's a portion of the problem that that I have to change, yeah. I'll put like the minus sign in front of it yeah. and skip the first, not rewrite the first half of the problem. I think that's okay. Show me what you mean specifically by your quiz and we'll talk about it, okay? Yeah. Um, do we have to have our substitutions correlating roughly with where the substitutions are? Applied? They don't have, and, and it's helpful, but they don't think you have to sort of like keep them lined up. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. And also it's okay. Just kind of keep them separate a little bit though so they don't get mashed in with the rest of the work. Okay, so changing this secant back into, uh, all the stuff back into um, x's. So does it make sense that x over six equals secant theta? Okay, so in your triangle, la, triangle, and your theta can go wherever you want. I just put it in that lower quarter, lower one, but it could also go in the upper one as long as you apply trigonometry correctly. So secant the reciprocal of cosine, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So in this reciprocal, in this ratio, what's the x? Hypotenuse. The hypotenuse. And what's the 6? Adjacent. adjacent side. And then real fast, what's the other side? Square root of x squared minus 3 Great. And it should pretty much always happen that the thing that was in your original integral is kind of showing up in this triangle. Do you guys see that's happened in every single one? Yeah, okay. All right, so we have ln, absolute value. Um, secant theta is great. And tangent theta is... Uh, mm -hmm, over 6. Okay, so that's totally fine with me. If you're checking your answers in Wolfram Alpha, they're going to give you something else. And I want to just talk about why it's the same thing. So here's what Wolfram Alpha will tell you. And we're going to say ln absolute value x plus root x squared minus 36. Nope, no, there's no over 6, okay? So does that weird anybody else out there? Like, oh my gosh, why is this the same thing, okay? Yeah, so here's why. So notice that there's a greatest common factor inside of the natural log thing, right? So let's take that out. ln of a sixth times x plus root x squared minus 36 plus c, okay? Is that all right? Does that just go with zero? Yes. So what happens when you have log of a product? It's log of the first thing plus log of the second thing. It's log of the first thing, and one-sixth is positive, so no absolute value bar is needed, right? Plus log of the second thing. Is that all right for everybody? And this, this first thing just kind of gets like sucked into the arbitrary constant c. Because C is any constant. You could call the first constant C1 and call this next constant C. And so that's, what, that's where this answer is coming from. And so you don't have to do that. I'll, I'll, I'm going to plead the fifth a little bit if we're going to make you do that on a test or something. I don't think so, but because we're recording and I have to ask. Um, but if you're checking your answers in Wolfram Alpha against the back of the book for practice problems, this might have happened. Okay, and it's just using properties of logs in a tricky way. If you were unlucky enough to be an AP calculus taking this class, they might give you a multiple choice question on a test that only had this answer. In which case, you're kind of like, you know, you have to know that trick, right? To pick the right one out of the choices. I mean, if you made it up there, that's probably going to be the closest answer to that, right? <clears throat> In some ways, but I've seen them do things that, anyway, it's possible to make it so it's, you can easily deceive students with the wrong answers. Uh -huh. Multiple choice is hard. Okay, so that's, that's just the why that works that way. Okay, great. So I'm going to pause.